bro. Good morning, everybody. So we continue with our discussion of monetary policy today. We have to deal with the last important problem of this chapter 15 that we began last uh, discussing yesterday, and that is the debate about monetary policy activist versus non-activist monetary policy two different approaches how to do it. So activist policy means that uh, macroeconomic policy of any kind should be used deliberately and actively and even proactively to influence the economic outcomes. You should be ahead of the curve, so to speak. And you should use, and this is a crucial, a crucial um, component of the activist policy to use discretionary power. That means that you shouldn't be bound by any fixed rules of the game or any fixed constraints about how you can exercise your uh, policy making powers. So that's activism. A specific uh, form of activism that kind of fell out of fashion in, in recent decades is the idea of fine-tuning. So actually fine-tuning is a use of the activist monetary policy so as to very finely and, and, and in great detail um, influence given macroeconomic aggregates such as employment, inflation and so on to essentially micromanaging macroeconomic policy. So you don't just adopt the broad goals of economic policy and use your powers to achieve them, you actually try to micromanage the entire process and to smooth out even the small departures from your uh, ideal that you seek to achieve. So that's the fine tuning that, that used to be much more popular in the um, 50s and 60s, 70s. After that, it fell out of fashion. But that's one of the one of the forms of the activist monetary policy. Non-activism means that policy-making powers shouldn't be exercised at the discretion of the um, policymakers, Federal Reserve System primarily. That policymakers should be bound by certain fixed rules. And now there are different ideas about what these rules should be, how the Federal Reserve System should increase or decrease the money supply and what kind of regulations and rules should govern that, these ideas. So the basic idea of, of, of non-activist monetary policy is that the best way of preventing, the best hope to prevent uh, a recession or to eliminate or smooth out a business cycle is not to go proactively and try to influence it directly or try to change it and so on, but rather to use a wisely, de uh, wisely designed rules in advance so as to prevent, so as to uh, forestall the appearance of the business cycle. So the rules should be designed in such a way as to make the appearance of the recession or the business cycle less likely. Not to cure the problem once it appears, but rather to prevent the disease from appearing. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for overutilizing this medical terminology that is all over the place these days, but it is particularly apt here. So non-activists want to use a certain safe and wisely designed rules that will make the appearance of recessions and economic crisis less likely. So that's the basic dividing line between the two approaches to monetary policy. I just want to remind you of something that is necessary for understanding everything that is going to follow now that we mentioned last week, this famous equation of exchange that you see at the bottom, at the bottom of the page here. 
Fisher's equation of exchange. You recognize it probably MV equals P times Q, where M is the money supply, V is the velocity of circulation of money. Velocity of circulation of money means the average number of times that a given monetary unit changes hands. It's essentially a measure of how frequently people buy and sell stuff. So speed or velocity of circulation. P is the price level in the economy. And Q is the real GDP or quantity of goods and services being produced. So P times Q is then the nominal GDP. So that's the GDP multiplied by the current price level. Without P, it's just the real GDP, just the real quantity of goods and services. Okay, so that's the equation. So this equation will be important because pretty much all forms of monetary policy try to do, try to manipulate one or two or even three of these variables so as to make the economy work better. So it's, it's a playground for monetary policy. This equation is, is the key in that regard. Okay, few major arguments for and against activist policy. First, how the case for an activist, or as I said, discretionary monetary policy uh, could be made. Number one, you can have a recession. You can have an economic crisis, an economic problem, and your economy will not quickly enough go back to its natural long-term real GDP production. So you can have a situation like this that we already studied here. The situation in which your long-term productivity is the green line. That's the real the potential real GDP that the economy demand and supply curves. And you are in a recessionary gap. And now if you do nothing, if you're driven by certain rules that do not allow that do not allow you to uh, engage in monetary policy now, what's going to happen is actually that the economy will slowly and gradually recover that remember the discussion from yesterday that the new, new businesses will open, that the old businesses will scale up their production, increase its productivity, but this process will take time and it, it will not be painless. It will, as they say, it will get worse before it gets better. Because whenever you are in a recession, it's not just a random reduction of uh, production and employment, it's actually a problem that will persist for a while both employment and low levels of productivity will persist for a time. So the, the question is whether you can, you, have, you can afford to wait for this process of, the, of production recovering on its own, going from point one here on the image number, uh, on the image in the middle of here, the picture B, from point one to point two, whether you can afford to wait for that. So the, the, the argument that activists and discretionary monetary policy wonks invoke here is that you don't have enough time for that. You cannot afford that. That's too, that's too long. That's too slow. So you have to do this thing on number three here. You have to shift the aggregate demand curve. You have to use monetary policy to go to the equilibrium to overcome the recessionary gap by monetary policy. And in order to do so, you need discretionary power of the Federal Reserve System. If you need, for example, in order to get from point one to point two prime on the picture number three here from the from the inter intersection AD1 and supply curve to AD2 and supply curve on the on the red line, if you need 15% increase in the money supply and the rules that your monetary policy is driven by do not allow you to do this, then you cannot do monetary policy. Then you have to settle for this suboptimal case B here, which is more painful and slower and economically less efficient for you. So that's the first argument that the proponents of the activist 
monetary policy uh, espouse is the idea that the economy may not recover quickly enough and if you don't have discretionary powers for monetary authorities to help it recover quicker actually you may end up in a in a suboptimal in an inferior economic position the second argument is actually that monetary policy is efficient so that goes without saying you cannot argue that somebody should do something without proving or without or without at least claiming to know that this thing can work or work so activists believe that monetary policy effective as as a tool of smoothing out business cycle and the third thing here is kind of implied in the previous two uh, that it is flexible so conditions could change imagine for example we will see later on that there are certain rules of monetary policy that say you have to increase money supply by a fixed percentage every year so that's pretty rigid rule and if conditions on the ground change that require you to to increase it more or to increase it less your hands are tied so activist monetary policy monetary policy that is based on discretion of policy makers rather than on the fixed predetermined rule rules rules is flexible you can react quicker you can react in a more appropriate fashion you can solve the problems quicker and better than without discretionary policy okay what about this is just a brief overview we will we will talk more about this in due course uh, the case for non-activist or rules-based monetary policy so the first thing is something that that is not always um, appreciated enough by the proponents of the uh, activist approach to monetary policy and it is that wages and prices are very flexible in a modern economy so they allow the uh, economy to equilibrate at a, at a much higher speed than activists believe that this process here let me show you uh, this process here in the middle picture can can go very fast actually it may not it may not take a very long time for an economy to recover and readjust and re-equilibrate on its own so everything hinges <laughs> strangely enough on the interpretation of some features of this middle graph here in your exhibit seven how quickly this process from the light blue aggregate supply line to the dark blue aggregate supply line will happen in the absence of any government intervention so non-activists believe that that process will go very quickly so that's one thing the second argument is actually that activist monetary policy may not work may not be efficient and the third point is that activist policy can further destabilize rather than, than stabilizing uh, macroeconomy making things worse so here is the example of how and why monetary policy may not be efficient so here you have the situation in which used money su money supply increase from 81 to 82 to increase to increase the real GDP yeah. so that's your idea that you want to move the economy from point one here from point one to this point here on the aggregate supply on the, on the short run aggregate supply curve so you believe that aggregate supply curve will remain where it is However, if changes, uh, one more thing, you want to achieve that, you see if you're successful in achieving that. So what's going to happen? If you're successful 
uh, real GDP will increase. That's one thing. But also the price level will increase. Now, the key million dollar question here is whether workers and other economic agents are going to anticipate this change. So you want to use monetary policy to increase prices and increase production in the short run. And if you succeed in doing so, your monetary policy is efficient. However, what is the problem here? The problem is that people are not idiots. That people may very well anticipate an increase in, in the money supply and they may anticipate that the actions of the Federal Reserve System will result in higher future prices. If they do anticipate this, they're going then to bargain for higher wages, higher prices of labor. Higher prices of labor will entail higher labor costs for producers. Higher labor costs will lead to lower production. Lower production will shift the uh, short-run aggregate supply curve to the left instead of remaining where it was before. So if people, if the monetary illusion doesn't work, if people are not tricked by this inflationary gimmick, this inflationary monetary policy to believe that they are that their wages are, that their same nominal wages are unchanged with a higher inflation, then you can expect to achieve higher production in the short run because people will not be asking for higher wages. However, if the price change built in, into this monetary policy is anticipated, then people will bargain for higher wages and this will lead to, to lower production and the shift in the aggregate supply curve to the left. And eventually you will end up in this on this point too, instead of at this top of the triangle here. Sorry. You will end up here where the inflation will be even higher because the, of the lower volume of production, the same amount of money lower volume of production. And productivity will be the same as before. So eventually you result, the result of your monetary policy instead of providing you with a um, slightly higher inflation and higher production will provide you only with higher prices and unchanged real GDP. So that can happen and that's a real possibility. There is a very big debate in macroeconomics so, so a lot is hinging on whether this is true or not this thing that I just described for you in the last five minutes. A lot is hinging on that, whether this is a real uh, possibility, whether this is a real phenomenon, this uh, accuracy of inflationary expectations, inflationary, inflationary anticipations. So if people are reasonably good in guessing the future price levels from the monetary policy that is, that is enacted, then the monetary policy is inefficient. So one guy, Robert Lucas, who, who started as a monetarist and uh, later on evolved, slightly he got a Nobel Prize in economics for arguing exactly exactly this point here, exactly this point that you cannot that monetary policy is bunk, monetary policy is inefficient because expectations are rational. That's the so-called school of rational expectations. So people, you cannot trick everybody even in the short run, about the future price level. So this entire trick works only if people do not anticipate inflation and people are very good in anticipating inflation. So if, if that's the case, then the only result you're going to achieve um, by increasing money supply will be higher inflation and nothing else. So that's one argument why the second argument that monetary policy may not work. The third argument is that actually activist policy may destabilize the economy, making them worse rather than better. So this is the example of the recessionary gap from which we start here. 
that we discussed before. So recessionary gaps is your starting point here on the on the yellow line. Here the uh, intersection of the short run aggregate supply curve and aggregate demand curve. The, this is the Q1 quantity of goods and services being currently produced. The green line, as you remember from yesterday, is the long run aggregate supply curve. So there is a recessionary gap, Qn minus Q1, this difference between the potential level of output that economy could produce with 100% of capacity and the actual level of output that is produced right now with less than 100% of capacity use. This is your starting point one. So what you, what you would like to achieve ideally now is to use monetary policy to increase aggregate demand. This shift to the right and you want to intersect with the long range aggregate supply curve at point one prime here. Okay, so that would be the equilibrium where the short run and long run aggregate supply curves intersect. That means that your short term production performance is maximized, is consistent with the long run uh, capabilities of your economy. So that no resources are underused or unutilized in the short run. So that's what you want to achieve, actually. You, you want your act, actual production of your economy to match the maximum potential productivity of your economy. And you hope to achieve that by pumping money into the economy here, which is graphically shown as a movement of the aggregate demand curve to the right. However, the catch here is that Things are going on in the same time. Any kind of macroeconomic stimulus, whether fiscal stimulus through, through government spending and tax cuts, where you expect to, to, to move the aggregate demand curve that way, to increase spending that way, or through monetary policy that you, that you expect to increase spending by pump. It will take some months until you reach the point one prime here until you reach the equilibrium, until you eliminate the recessionary gap. Now, the problem is that the economy, that people, entrepreneurs, producers, workers, and so on, they're not sitting idle and waiting for your stimulus to work. They're doing their own stuff in the, in, in, in the meantime. This entire process of recovery, reopening new businesses, relocating businesses, scaling down the unsuccessful businesses, scaling up the ones that are promising, and so on. So this process of economic, of supply side economic recovery, so independent economic recovery, it will go on no matter what you do. Even if you do nothing, this short run aggregate supply curve will be moving slowly or, or, or uh, more quickly to the right at the same time. So what you're risking here, depending on the time sequence of events, whether your stimulus is taking effect quicker or the spontaneous changes in the economy are taking place quicker. You can end up in a situation in which you move the aggregate demand curve after six months from position one to position one prime, but the aggregate supply curve did not remain where it was. It moved on its own to the right. People increased the levels of productivity and the use of, uh, of productive capacity Considerably in the meantime, production, supply of goods and services increased. So you eventually end up at a new equilibrium point two, where the economy ends up, which is, you can guess now, a problem, which is an inflationary gap that we studied and discussed yesterday. So now you have the Q2 level of production in, in the economy, which is higher than the long-range aggregate supply curve, quantity allowed by the long-run long economic productivity of the country. So that means that your monetary policy hasn't worked. Your goal was to reach the equilibrium at the green line, one prime, here. That was your objective. That was your goal. However, because spontaneous changes in the economy that you cannot control, 
you cannot if if you don't live in North Korea or Mao Zedong's China or Stalin's Russia, you cannot control what people, entrepreneurs and workers are doing. They might be increasing production and increasing the size of the enterprises and raising wages and doing all kinds of things independently of, of any macroeconomic policy that you do. And they may be shifting production, increasing production dramatically. So eventually you, your monetary measures take effect, you end up in an inflationary gap. So you end up with a higher level of production and with a lower level of inflation. And we know that this is unsustainable, right? You know, so that this will have to go down. This, this will have to go back eventually. So now what is the problem? You, you, you are going to go back. Recession needs to happen now once again. So if you overdo it, you are in for a recession. So now instead of waiting a little bit doing nothing and waiting that the short run aggregate supply curve shifts to the right. You are so impatient that you wanted to push the process a little bit by by monetary policy. And the only thing that you achieved is, uh, is actually that you're going to cause another recession because the economy is unsustainable here. It has to go back to the green line. The green line is the key always. Always you have to be on that line. Your productivity has to be there. It cannot be left or right. So. The only way for you to go there would be if you don't want to if you don't want to use monetary policy is to allow the uh, aggregate supply curve to shrink, which means production to decrease, which means another recession. So actually, instead of uh, speeding up the process of recovery, from the first recession, you're, you're going to end up in a situation in which you're going to cause another recession. So that's a real possibility. And we have some empirical evidence that this happens in 1970s, in, 19, in the 1960s, and especially 1970s. This was a very real possibility, real occurrence. That the misguided activist uh, policies led to... Um, repeated and frequent episodes of um, of recessions. Okay. Uh, now let's talk about the non-activist monetary policies or proposals. What could be done? What kind of fixed rules if we agree that the um, activist policy might not be efficient, what are the alternatives? The alternatives are different rules that we may adopt in order to guide monetary policy. The first rule is the so-called constant money, money growth rate. The second is a variation on the first. It's, it's just a slight, slight tweak on the constant money growth rate. It's the predetermined money growth rate rule. We'll see in a second what, what is the difference. The third is the inflation targeting. Fourth is Taylor rule. Taylor is an economist who devised his own rule about what the central bank should be doing with, with respect to monetary policy, and I'll explain that in a moment. And the fifth one is the so-called nominal GDP targeting. That's a relatively new relatively new policy proposal. And there is a sixth one that is not particularly um, pertinent nowadays, but it's a real possibility that should that, that justifies consideration. That's the gold standard. Gold standard is another rules-based monetary policy. So let's start first with the constant money growth rate. Uh, that's a, that's a rule proposed by Milton Friedman, uh, the main proponent of the Chicago School and Monetary Policy Theory. Uh, the, the constant uh, money growth rate says that the money supply, M, here, let me go back, MV equals PQ, so that the M should grow at the same rate that Q is growing. Okay, so M 
if Q is growing, Q is a real GDP, if it grows 3% per year, which means that the production of goods and services grows by 3% per year, an ideal monetary policy is to increase the money supply by, by 3%. And you are not allowed to change that rule. And they were joking, actually, that you, would, you wouldn't need a Federal Reserve Bank, actually, for this monetary policy. Any computer could do this kind of monetary policy. So the hope here is not that you're going to be curing the business cycle by using monetary policy. The hope here is actually that by observing this rule, you're not going to get the business cycle to begin with. That this stability of the mathematical relationship uh, between, between money and, and real productivity will allow for the stable price level and stable stable uh, economy in the long run. If you assume, but there is one there is one big if here. The big if is that the idea that velocity of circulation is constant. So if velocity of circulation is constant and money supply and real productivity grow at the same rate, okay, so then the price level has to be constant. So that's the basic idea. The price level has to be constant, which, which would mean stable prices. So the main ideal of this policy is to provide for the stable price level, for the CPI or P as an index of, of the price level should remain relatively stable. If you assume that V velocity of circulation is constant or relatively constant, then the only thing that you need to do is actually to make sure that the, the rate of increase in money supply tracks closely the rate of increase in real productivity. So if real productivity of the economy increases by 3%, you want your money supply to match that at 3%. If your money supply increases 2%, you're going to have deflation, obviously. So the price level will have to adjust downward in order for, for, for the equation to hold. If this is, you multiply this by 0 0.03 and this by 0 0.02, then P has to adjust. Since V is constant, P will have to, P will have to go down. If money supply increases faster than the quantity of, uh, of goods and services, then you will have inflation. The price level will have to go up. That's the idea. Uh, macroeconomic stability. So, so, so we can summarize this idea of a constant money growth rate rule. Macroeconomic stability equals stable prices. Stable prices require that money supply grows at the same rate as real productivity of the economy. The assumption, the key caveat, the key proviso here is that V, velocity of circulation, is constant. Now, if velocity of circulation is not constant, then you can tweak your rule. Then your rule for changing the money supply will be equal to the uh, growth rate in real GDP minus growth rate in velocity. So that means that you want to adjust your um, rate of money growth here. Let me show again the equation. If you assume that velocity declines slightly and Q increases, then you subtract v from q if v is negative for example minus something you subtract it from q you get a bigger number so so that bigger number then for for m so if velocity of circulation goes down you essentially the idea is that you adjust your rate of increase in money supply by a little bit more so it, it is going to increase uh not at the exact same percentage as Q, but a little bit more to compensate for a slight drop in the velocity of circulation. And vice versa, if velocity of circulation increase, then your money supply is going to increase 
not by the same percentage uh, as the real productivity Q, but by a little bit less. So you want to keep MV as constant as possible. Okay, but that's just variation on the previous rule, previous uh, constant rate of change rule. So the first two rules are based on the idea that GDP, th this is important to bear in mind, that GDP is something that is exogenously determined. Real productivity, real GDP of an economy is determined by its physical productivity, by its value productivity, uh, dictated by the um, availability of labor, technology, institutions, uh, capital, machinery, equipment, international trade, and so on, the real factors. So you take that as granted. You don't use monetary policy to influence GDP, to try to fine-tune or increase or decrease GDP and so on. You just, you just believe that GDP is what it is in the long run, and that the function of monetary policy is not to mess up things. And the only way not to mess up macroeconomy is to adjust the rate of growth of money supply to match the rate of growth exogenously uh, determined, determined from the outside by the real factors, by non-monetary factors, uh, real GDP to, to match money supply, to match the real GDP. So that's the basic idea. In the first case, you have a direct relationship. Real GDP goes 3%, money supply needs to go 3%. In this slightly tweaked, predetermined money growth rate, you actually adjust the uh, uh, rate of growth in money supply for the changes in the velocity of circulation. But in both cases, you adjust the monetary policy, you adjust the rate of growth of money supply to match the existing or pre-existing or, or, or assumed rates of economic growth that you cannot control by monetary policy. The third idea is, uh, I will skip because the Taylor rule is one, one rule, but in order to understand what the Taylor rule is, you will have to first understand inflation targeting. So inflation targeting is actually the idea that the Federal Reserve System should use monetary policy so as to target certain level of inflation. So that means we're going to do whatever it takes. We don't know what it's going to be, how much money supply will increase, but our goal, the rule that we are driven by, is the rule that the, the CPI increase, increase in inflation next year will be 2%. And this inflation targeting is a one of the key tools of monetary policy of central banks. Pretty much all Western central banks are using this, this rule. And usually it's 2% is a target inflation rate that they want to achieve. So if this means that you need to increase money supply by 4%, you increase it 4%. If it means that you need to lower interest rate, you lower interest rate. If it means that you should increase interest rate, you would increase interest rate. I will give you one example. Last year, actually, there was a fear that American economy is speeding up, that the American economy is moving towards this inflationary disequilibrium, that the wage rates were increasing, that uh, that price level started creeping up, verging on 2%, that productivity was increasing significantly, and then the Federal Reserve System said, oh, oops, this means that the, money, that, that the rate of growth in money supply is too much, we cannot allow inflation to go beyond 2%, so we're going to pull pull the levers back, we are gonna de we are gonna reduce the money supply and they try to do it by raising interest rates, federal funds rates. A couple of occasions in 2019, the main, the main reason for that was to prevent inflation from increasing. Okay, one variation of this is that connects together, uh, th that explains the rules of monetary policy in a recessionary and inflationary gap, is the so-called 
Taylor rule. So Taylor rule after the economist uh, um, Taylor. Uh, what is the name? I think it's John Taylor. Yeah, yeah. John Taylor. Uh, the idea is to uh, react to inflation by increasing interest rate and to react on recession by lowering interest rate. So the Taylor rule actually has a mathematical formula that you don't need to remember now, but the main the main point of the of, of the Taylor rule actually that the it specifies how the policy of manipulating interest rates should react to inflationary and recessionary disequilibria. And it uses inflation and unemployment as the key components here. So if unemployment increases beyond certain point, the interest rates should go down. The monetary policy should. It's consistent with inflation targeting. It's actually both inflation targeting and we can say unemployment targeting in the same time. So whenever whenever unemployment increases beyond certain point, the monetary authorities should use uh, should use uh, monetary policy to to influence it. Whenever GDP gap occurs, the, this is this is an invitation to rules based. Um, policy approach is so-called nominal GDP targeting. So what is that? That's inflationism, pure and simple. That's the ideology of printing money. Sometimes it's called market monetarism, but that's the idea. I, I just go back to our equation here, and that becomes much more, that becomes more popular by the day. MV equals PQ. So now, remember Friedman's rule, and, and the, this first two fixed rules that we discussed, all of them assume that Q is given, that real GDP is given, and that what you need to do actually to adjust the money supply so as not to mess up the real economy, not to create inflation or deflation. So it's essentially a passive and um, accommodating monetary policy, monetary policy of adjusting, adjusting the money supply to the requirements and demands of the real economy. Nominal GDP targeting is actually the opposite of that. You want to use money supply to engineer higher levels of productivity. So you, you have a target for nominal GDP increase next time, prices times production, and you print as much money as it is necessary to achieve that. If production goes down for whatever reason, instead of lowering the money supply, you increase money supply as much as you can. So actually, P times Q is the nominal GDP. So you use the levers of monetary policy to prevent P times Q nominal GDP from going down. So one of the consequences of that is that you cannot allow price level ever to fall. So deflation is not allowed, even if Q increases, even if productivity increases, if P times Q, that's the nominal GDP, goes down or remains stable, you need to print more money to, to overcome. And they say that the failure to follow this policy was the main reason or one of the main reasons for the, great, for the economic recession in 2007 and 2008. Two, three, four, five was increasing. So when people are talking about expansionary monetary policy versus contractionary monetary policy, they usually they almost always talk about the aggregate M. If you're increasing money supply, you are expanding it. That's expansionary monetary policy. If you are reducing money supply, that's contractionary monetary policy. N not for nominal GDP targeters. For them, the measure of of how contractionary or how expansionary monetary policy is what happens on the right side of the equation here, P times Q. If that drops, even if you increase the money supply by 50%, that's contractionary monetary policy for that. 
So that's the peculiarity of their position. So actually then you need to increase money supply three times, 40 times, 50 times, whatever, whatever it takes in order to keep this nominal spending or nominal, nominal GDP constant or increasing. Okay, so finally gold standard, a few things about gold standard. Why gold standard is a system of fixed rules. So just a few, few basic points about what gold standard is and is not. The gold standard is a system of commodity money, commodity money. So our modern monetary system, all of the policy approaches that I discussed are based on the so-called fiat money which means that the government determines what is the money and what is the means of what the means of payment and the government determines the value of money increases and decreases the money supply in the gold standard money supply changes but it is not determined by the government it is determined by market forces in the gold standard gold commodity metal is the money and paper currency that may circulate is just a representation, is just a substitution for, for, for the gold. So you can have bank notes and deposit currency that just reflect the quantity of gold money that exists out there. So the only way how the money supply can increase in, in the gold standard is by uh, digging out and producing more gold. So this is the key difference. Gold standard was a system that prevailed in America in the 19th century, in the better part of the civilized world in the 19th century. And that was a century of a very low inflation. Actually, there was a deflation for the most part, especially in the later part of the, of the, of the 19th century, the, the general price level in America had fallen. Why did it, why did it fall? Because the economic productivity was very fast, three, four, five, six percent per year. Real GDP was increasing by that much, but the supply of gold, supply of money was in the 19th century. Uh, so th the simplest rule of the, of the gold standard is that quantity of money is determined by the quantity of gold that is dug out. As simple as that. So the main advantage of gold standard is that you cannot create inflation so easily. So it's very expensive. To, it's not expensive at all to create new credit by central bank, to buy government bonds. You just click one click of a mouse or to print more paper currency. That's very cheap. So the costs of inflation in the fiat money are very low, whereas the cost of inflation are extremely high in gold standard. So in order to dig out more gold, you will need to invest heavily in equipment and machinery and labor force to, to, increase, to increase production of gold that's very expensive. So you cannot so easily inflate the money supply. Uh, also, your ability to conduct monetary policy then is very limited. Your hands are tied if you cannot increase. If, if gold is the money, and the quantity of gold is relatively rigid and fixed, then your hands are tied as the government to use monetary stimulus. So that's the reason why the proponents of the free market economy and non-interventionism very much love gold standard because it ties the hands of the government. They cannot do much to mess up the economy. And that's the reason why Keynesians and monetarists and modern proponents of macroeconomics, they do not like gold standard because it prevents by fixed rules that, that uh, by its fixed rule that says the money supply equals quantity of gold. Quantity of gold is determined by the physical resource that is very expensive. That means you cannot use a pro-economic framework that requires activist and strong monetary policy. Okay, that would be all for today. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, post them on canvas so i will collect your questions in the next day or two and then i will record the video answering uh, any one of them if i can so have a nice day and i'll see you soon next week